So it's just uh, 15 minutes before we break for the lunch break. There's just a couple of pages, a few pages left of that talk that I was reading, so I'll just finish the Ajahn Cha. It's okay just to continue meditating, aware of your in and out breaths as you hear the words, contemplate their meaning. Interesting storm we just had, Ajahn Pavro and I living on top of a mountain in Pechabun, very familiar with this phenomena of nice, cool weather most of the time and a big storm rolling in every now and then. It feels very familiar. And our minds can be a bit like that, can't they? Fairly peaceful sometimes. And then some big storm comes from somewhere, blows through. We have to see it like that. We have to see these sankharas as having their own nature, karmically conditioned, coming in, blowing up a storm, making a lot of noise, blowing themselves out of steam and then ceasing. Calm before the storm, calm after the storm. With breath meditation and training in breath meditation, we have to be the calm in the eye of the storm. That's what we try to have this knowing that knows things as they are and uh, without grasping, just seeing karmic conditions as karmic conditions, bodies as bodies, thoughts as thoughts, feelings as feelings, four elements as four elements, everything arising and ceasing due to its own nature. So remember Ajahn Chah was talking about it's as if we are guests in a hotel and uh, we get used to staying there and then when the manager comes and tells us that it's time to go we realize we're attached. But those who see Sankara are at peace. They see the mind and body not as self but only as Sankara. If something arises into existence it is just Sankara. There is no being or person, no one who is happy or suffering. It is only Sankara. It is purged of happiness or suffering. There is nobody who is affected. If you see Sankara like this, you see Dhamma. Nobody is any sort of entity, not a person, an individual, or a being. There is no one who is elated or miserable, no one who gets angry or attached, no one who dies things arise. Sankara are like that. Seeing Dhamma is like that. Whatever arises in the minds of yogis, they will know the Dhamma to that extent. If your view is like this, this is merit. All merits come together here at the point of peace. If we try to adjust or change Dhamma because of a lack of clear vision, there will be suffering. Take the breath for example. It is continuously flowing in and out without break. The body depends on it for life. It is nourishment, like food. It enters the body and supports it. The air goes in and out so the Sankara can survive. In and not out, or out and not in, and there is trouble. But having been born, we don't want to get old. We don't want to die. Being together, we don't wish to part. Having things, we don't want to lose them. But it cannot turn out as we wish, because this is just the way things are. All dhammas arise from causes and conditions. When the causes and conditions exist, the result occurs accordingly. Who has created this? It is just the law of nature. When it breaks up, that is also nature. This law is called dhamma. Formal teaching to explain this is simply a matter of skillful language and speech. It is not genuine Dhamma itself, but only the path to train people and to point out the way to understand truth. Still, we think that we have Dhamma, we understand Dhamma, we are Dhamma. Well, if this were really the case, we would not have craving, anger or delusion. If we did know, see and embody Dhamma, we wouldn't have these things. So, we are the slaves of the afflictions without any surcease. If we really see, 
these things just evaporate from us. The profound Dhamma is like this. This is one matter. Then there is the Dhamma of practicing a code of conduct. People living together with restraint and consideration. This too is Dhamma. Living together without quarrel or strife, it is called Sila Dhamma, the way of virtuous behavior. It is the Dhamma that the populace at large needs to practice for happiness. But this happiness is just attained as the beginning of suffering. It's a little better than people who have no knowledge or morality, but still, we make this happiness and keeping it leads to suffering. This alone does not get us beyond, but it is still better than not having it. Making the causes and conditions for going beyond is another matter. So when you listen to the Dhamma, don't think that it's all there is to do. Take it to heart and practice. Make it the cause and condition for attainment of Nibbana, the deathless, the cessation of suffering and true peace. We who are Buddhists need to study this, learn it little by little and put it into practice through meditation. Even if desire, negativity and foolishness are in our hearts, let us know them. When they arise, we know them and we know Dhamma, and know that they are our enemies. Oh, when will they be removed? Remove them step by step through consistent practice, not through consistent sleep. Practice sila and Dhamma. There will still be some grasping attachment remaining, but you will know you have it. And even if you are suffering, don't let it get too great, but have a boundary and be aware of it. When you are tending cows and buffaloes, they may get into the field, so you have to control them. They may eat some grain, but don't let them eat a lot. They will only eat a little because you are on the job. If you sleep through the day, they will probably polish off your crop, so you can't be heedless. Our aim in coming to study and practice is for our minds to see Dhamma. When our minds see Dhamma, we will end suffering. We don't need to wonder what we are practicing for. We have eyes and ears, legs that are not broken. If we have opened our eyes, we will do what needs to be done, without waiting for or depending on the blind ones. We are able to speak. We are not mute. When we see, we can speak before them. We wake up first, and we get going early in the morning, not waiting for the ones who still sleep. Why? Because this is a place of danger. It is a place of turmoil and confusion an imperfect realm full of faults. The Buddha taught that, if you know, you should just go and not wait for the benighted. If your legs can carry you, don't wait for the ones with broken legs. Why? Escape from the enemy little by little until you are free and clear. It means developing virtue and knowledge. Until the day you get free of evil, you make the causes of goodness little by little and this becomes the cause that is dedicated to the aim of everyone getting free. Awaken yourself. Lotuses in the same pond don't grow at the same pace. While some are blooming, some are still in the water and others are at the level of the water. You should do what you can according to your abilities. If you wait for the others, you might be eaten by fish and turtles. When fire is flaring up and threatening to burn down your house, you can't ignore it and take a rest. You have possessions and you have to grab them and get out. Desire, anger and delusion scorch us just like that. Death follows us always, every day, without cease. At the very least, we should reduce our becoming and birth in the round of existence. In all our merit-making and other spiritual, spiritual activities we recite, May it be a cause for, realiza for realizing Nibbāna. What should we do to make the causes for Nibbāna? Meditation is essential. You don't merely sit here and listen to the words. That doesn't become a cause. First you listen. Then you have to contemplate the meaning. The things you are, are supposed to give up, give them up. This guy hasn't got it yet. That one, I'm not sure about the way she practices. Don't entertain such thoughts. Don't put it on to someone else. If a tiger is chasing you, you don't wait for the other person to run. How will you escape the tiger like this? This is a danger to you. Nibbana is not a place to stay or go to. 
Or to put it another way, it is not going and not stopping. It doesn't have advancing, retreating or stopping. Understand that. When you enter and see, the fruit will come on its own. See the Dhamma, earn your profit, and then even if you haven't gotten to the end of the path, there will be no more doubting. This is appropriate for those of us who come to study the Dhamma. Outside of the Dhamma of our teacher, there is nothing that can bring us to live in harmony together, to go beyond suffering and unsatisfactory experience and to realize happiness and tranquility. Dhamma is far superior to anything you can find in the home. The things we have at home generally only bring trouble. It's not like they are going to cause peace. In the realm of family and possessions, there are only things for worry, concern and struggle. Things that stab us. And Dhamma has more value than that. But if we live among these things, we must have Dhamma. We must and can't do without it. If there is no Dhamma to match these things, they are not complete. Don't be careless. If we really understand and contemplate Dhamma, we will see value in it. The things at home will still be there, but if we see Dhamma, we will stop carrying them. Then there is still the busyness and involvement, but we, but we know what it is all about and we won't take it for something real. Like dealing with a child who says, Mom, this happened. Dad, I need that. Hey, look at me. The parent says, Yeah, sure, okay but doesn't take it too seriously. You answer to make the child feel happy and secure, but your mind is not caught up in the story because you don't think in that way. So you can remain with your family and worldly responsibilities doing what you have to do, but you aren't following the stream of worldliness. You are acting for peace and detachment, not for slavery and involvement. This is called the accomplishment and enjoyment of wealth. Even though you have wealth and possessions, you know them for what they are, know how to use them and live above them. If you can practice like this, you will come to know that Dhamma really does have value. But it is necessary to understand, to contemplate and practice. If you think things are real, there is suffering and there is fear. You are afraid of the different ways things may turn out. Everywhere you look there is fear. Actually, you just fear yourself. There is thinking, then fear follows immediately. It deceives you, creating a picture to mislead you. For people who are so fearful, whether they go into a house or a forest, there, all, there will immediately be ghosts haunting them. Even when they hear mice running around, they are frightened and think it's the sound of ghosts. Immediately they are afraid but it is only consciousness making a picture to deceive. Or maybe you have some problem at home. Just thinking about it makes you want to cry. And people criticize each other. This one doesn't care about me, and that one makes trouble for me. The mind runs away like that. Actually, no one is doing anything but you making the pictures. If you make the pictures, you will get lost and eventually end up crying. If you get very happy, you are making a picture. It gets to the point of laughing or crying. But still, it is just you doing it. This is good. This is really good. You are just forgetting yourself, lost in your joy and laughter. The mind picks up one thing and you feel fear. Something else you feel is repulsive, so you hate it. Then you love another thing. You become obsessed until you are actually insane. And there is no end to your tears flowing. There is no end to it when you react like this, making pictures. All this is just the carrying on of people as to what is actually happening, there is nothing. There is nothing to cry or laugh over, nothing worthy of love or hate in itself. It is only your mind being tricked. So the Buddha said to work on your mind here, correct your mind at this point. The Dhamma is genuine, it is certain, it is the truth. But we are not sure. We laugh and we cry. We love and hate, reacting to things. Things are said to be good and bad and off we go in pursuit because we believe that we exist as self-entities and that things belong to us. 
This is just being deluded. So you should not take anything, the body in good or bad health, the mind in elation or depression, as being too real. You only destroy yourself by doing that. The Buddha said, when happiness comes, don't believe it too much. It is not something to cry or laugh over. It isn't something out there. It is here within us where things are happening. Results being born from causes. There is really nothing, only our grasping, that makes things appear like this. Not seeing Dhamma, we are always trying to make real these things that are not real. But when we talk about things not being real, some will say there is nothing we can do. It doesn't mean being totally passive and defeated. Without going to extremes and believing too much in things as real, you take care of things as is appropriate. While, ob while objects are not yet broken, while the body is not yet sick, take care of them so you can make good use of them. But when things break, you let go without tears. Don't end up crying over these internal and external phenomena for no purpose. We have the habit of seeing body and mind as self. We call them us and ours. But when we are involved in such grasping, we are outside of the Dhamma, and the only result is that we suffer. You should understand that all the things we practice are for leading the mind to see Dhamma and to be the Dhamma. If you see Dhamma, then although you have, then although you have had the habit of anger, even if it returns, it will come without decreasing energy. Sorry, it will come with decreasing energy. The same is true of desires, and this is because of the understanding and sensitivity born in the mind from correct practice and understanding. It will change you for the better. You don't need to change or improve the Dhamma. Don't try to resolve things that are done already. Resolve the things that are not yet accomplished facts. If you are trying to plane a piece of wood that is full of knots and hard like a rock, you should know when to give up. Or will you just sit and cry over it? And if another piece is already smooth and varnished, you don't need to plane it further. Instead of trying to adjust the Dhamma to fit you, adjust yourself to fit the Dhamma. Dhamma is truth. If you reach the truth, there is no big or small, no happiness or suffering. There is peace. And even if there is thinking, the mind must be peaceful. If you experience phenomena, they will be just right, with nothing to try to increase or decrease. The characteristics of mind will be such that when the mind meets objects and conditions, it has this truth. It's like having only one chair in a room. You sit there, and when others come, they have nowhere to sit. Mind is like that. The mental afflictions may come, but because Dhamma is in the mind, they have nowhere to sit down so they will have to go on their way. If you have mindful awareness of yourself, then when sense contact and mental activity give rise to the habits of desire, anger and delusion, there is no place for them to stay in the mind. There is one seat and you are occupying it already, so the habits cannot sit, they will leave the room. They can't move you from Dhamma. The path and the afflictions fight it out in the mind. If there is no one sitting there, the afflictions can sit down and become the owners. This means you don't have presence of mind, you don't understand Dhamma. So delusion can take the seat, and then there is no end to suffering. The path and defilements fight each other in this way. If the path is brought to fullness, then when things happen in the mind, we meet the Dhamma. This takes a person with energy, one who is not energetic will will retreat at this point. The factors involved here are simply mind and its internal and external objects. If the mind is not fooled by these objects, what is the problem? Objects are objects, mind is mind. This is listening to Dhamma to make it reach the mind. When that happens and Dhamma enters the mind, there is no problem. The path kills the afflictions with the meditation practice. If there is no one home, unwanted guests can come and make themselves comfortable. They sit down and eat and make a mess. Is that the result you want? Because you don't understand Dhamma and don't know right and wrong, 
good and bad, and don't recognize the way the mind contacts objects and reacts, they push you all over the place. If things appear to be good, you will smile and laugh. If they are bad, they make you upset and you may come to tears. It is the same as the house with its owner absent, spinning around like that, unable to separate things. This is a Dhamma practitioner who doesn't really know Dhamma. It is someone who is operating at a loss. So you have to meditate to get the Dhamma to enter your mind. This is why we listen to the Dhamma on every Lunar Observance Day and other holidays. So in all activities and postures, learn to do this. When, sen when sense objects come, get a handle on them by remembering they are one thing and the mind is another. Separate them out. Otherwise, you don't know them. You follow what you perceive as good and bad, and this brings suffering. Not satisfied with them, you suffer. The mind is deluded by objects. The mind lacks discernment. So set up mindful recollection and awareness of yourself. We say that in all postures you should keep the meditation on Buddha in mind. Buddha means that the one who knows is arising continuously. When objects come, you know them. Just a little bit more. When objects come, you know them. You can resolve things and can expound the truth. This is the fruit of Buddha. Let there be the one who knows. Practice Buddha just for this. This is called hearing Dhamma and realizing fruition. Knowing Dhamma and practicing it. You should be practicing and seeing it so you become it in your mind. This is called one who understands and sees. This is the way that the Buddha's teaching bears fruit. So some nice, profound and firm Dhamma from Lumpur Cha as usual, urging us not to be fools, <laughs> urging us to be diligent, urging us not to be lazy, urging us not to fall asleep and to maintain the Buddha and these beautiful similes about what can happen if you're heedful when you have Buddha, you have the knowing it's like restraining your buffaloes and your cows if you aren't heedful, you don't restrain the mind properly the cows get in and eat all the crops so it is like that, isn't it? the other beautiful simile, sitting in the chair guests come and go. If you really know them with mindful awareness for what they are, they come and they go. And he talks about making suffering into small suffering, making small suffering into no suffering and large suffering into little suffering. That's what we can do when we have a good quality of mindful awareness, when we know sense objects as sense objects, no more laughing and crying or at least as Ajahn Chah is explaining when the craving arises in the mind, it arises with less power and it stays, it doesn't stay for as long because that which knows them is sitting in the seat. And he's saying, but if we aren't sitting in the seat, the guests come in and eat the food and make a mess. And uh, so we all have experience of that. What's it like when the cows get in the field? What's it like when the guests make a mess? On the other hand, what's it like when you are sitting in the seat? and you really can see sense objects as sense objects and not self. So we have uh, a good opportunity here to continue training. Lumpur Chah is recommending we keep up our Bhutto recitation because this helps us to uh, maintain that consistent mindfulness, that which knows. So it's probably enough for now. Hope that was helpful. <laughs>